we're here in Andover, Hampshire in England and we're interviewing as part of our Parents of the Field project Dr. Frank Barnaby uh, who is our old friend and colleague uh, from the beginnings of the field of peace studies or peace research or conflict research or whatever we're going to call it. Uh, and we're going to start with our usual question, Frank, which is at the very beginning of the development of this field or discipline or whatever we're going to call it, uh, people came into it from all sorts of different backgrounds and all sorts of different experiences and for all sorts of different reasons. So what was yours? Where, where, where did you come from? How did well, you get involved? Well, I'm a nuclear physicist by training. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, and when I left university in 1951, was it? Fifty fifty one. Mm. I went to work at Audemast and our atomic weapons research establishment. Mm -hmm. And I worked there on the effects of nuclear weapon, the effects of the explosion, mm -hmm. not on nuclear weapon design, but the effects of the explosion. Yeah. And I was part of a, a group, a team, which went to Australia on the first oh. British nuclear weapon mm -hmm. tests. Yeah. In 1950, well, I went in 1953. It was a test before that, but I went to the 1953 series, and again in 1956. Mm. So the experience of seeing nuclear weapons explode, which is quite dramatic. I mean, it's also it's rather, rather impressive physics, of course, but mm. the actual explosion is dramatic, particularly if you imagine it happening over a large city. Mm. And so I, that made me wonder about. Uh, the value of nuclear weapons should there be should should we have them and all that mm. and mm. I think that was the reason I mean it's a very difficult question to answer because yeah, sure. to know what the truth is because mm. often obviously having to earn a living comes into it as well and so on mm. but I think there's no doubt that the sight of nuclear weapons going off did have an effect on me mm -hmm. and so eventually I <coughs> Um, after after working at Audemars, and I went to work at University College London, mm -hmm. and became interested in, in um, disarmament issues, mm. and then joined Pugwash. Ah, so, okay. And then went to Cypri. So that that's really the mm -hmm. thumbnail sketch of it. Mm. I hadn't realised you'd been at, at University College uh, in the. Well, uh, I was at the. Uh, I was actually at the. What happened was that I went from Audemaston mm. into the use of radioisotopes in medicine. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, and there was a very good medical school, as you will know, at oh, University yes. College. Mm -hmm. So I worked there in a, in a group. Mm. Uh, it was a medical research council group, but it mm. had links with the university and the college, of mm. course. Yes. So that's really ah, okay. what happened. And while I was at the there, I was interested in John Burton's group, so I used to visit that, and that's where right. I met you. Yes, that's <laughs> I, re I remember that, yes. Uh, one's memory really does go after a while, isn't it? Um, okay, so uh, you mentioned Pugwash, and one of the things that we always ask people, which I'm going to ask you now rather than later, is um, one of the uh, ways in which people got to know each other uh, at a distance were, were sort of conferences and organisations like Pugwash. So tell us a bit about Pugwash and how you got involved in Pugwash and <coughs> what were the networks there that you actually found and used and found useful? Uh, well, I got involved with Pugwash, of course, because of my growing interest in nuclear disarmament mm -hmm. issues, yeah. what, what one should do about nuclear weapons. Mm. And uh, I, I went to some Pugwash conferences mm. and seminars, uh, one in the early 60s, I mean right at the very beginning, on mm. nuclear weapon proliferation. So they were in at the ground, uh, the ground floor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then Eventually, I went to work for Pugwash. I mm. was the executive secretary of Pugwash full time, working right. with Joe Rockland, mm -hmm. uh, uh, until I went to to Cypri, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, well, you were asking about the networks. Yeah. Who yeah. was who was in well, Pugwash at that time? Well, of course, a huge number of very mm. famous people. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, it was during that time that the group that. Were, were worked on the Manhattan Project mm. uh, and decided 
that nuclear weapons should not be used again. Mm -hmm. They became very anti-nuclear mm. weapons, of course, interested in seeing their abolition, mm -hmm. were there. People like Bernard Feld, Rabinovich, mm. Wick Weissner, very f and, and also Milyonchikov in the from the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. so very famous people. Mm. Uh, uh, so I, I was working there full time as a very young person, <coughs> when that generation was still there, mm -hmm. which of course was absolutely fascinating. Yes, it must have been. So. Uh, Powell from Bristol, mm. and, uh, Rudy Powers, and all the rest of them. Mm. Uh, yes. And uh, most of them, though, as you say, were sort of natural scientists. Um, were there any people from the social sciences there who were thinking about these issues? Was there an input from uh, the Scandinavians at all at this time? What, what, what? Uh... Not very much. Mm. Uh, Kissinger, of course, was uh, involved with the mm -hmm. Cold Wars, yeah. believe it or not. Oh yes. Yeah, and uh, but but basically, the driving group mm. were the nuclear physicists mm -hmm. who had been on the Manhattan Project. Mm. They were the sort of core uh, philosophical right. input. Yeah. But there were some some others, obviously. But I mean, as time went on. Uh, as they moved from the 60s into the 70s mm -hmm. and so on, then more and more uh, social scientists joined, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. But it, there, even then, there was a very large group of natural scientists who formed the backbone of the organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Let me say something else about mm -hmm. Pugwash. Um, uh, of course, one of the obvious points is that the original people in Pug was aged and, mm. and therefore they had to get in new blood. Mm. The other thing was that the, the, the very famous people were, had very close contacts with their government, ah. the mm -hmm. Soviet Union for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the basic things, one of the basic advantages of, of, of Pug was, mm. that things said at the Pugwash conferences would get back to the decision makers, yeah. presidents and so mm -hmm. on. But of course in order to maximize the effect of that it had to be uh, private. Mm. So Pugwash was essentially a closed organization. There was very, they, they, they avoided publicity mm. very much so in order to have effects on the policy makers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense Pugwash did a, a really valuable job. Mm. But then, as I say, the uh, older gr group um, died out, so to speak, mm. or, or re actually retired, yeah. properly retired. And then younger people came in who had less influence on the government. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, the other thing is that in those days, we're talking about the 50s and 60s, mm. Pugwash was the only contact between East and West. Mm. Yeah. The, discussions between Americans and Soviets were really confined to, to Pugwash. Mm. Uh, that's not much of an exaggeration. So it was unique in that sense. And of course that eventually disappeared too because mm. other organizations began to have contacts with the Soviet right. Union who became a little more open. Mm. Uh, and so the influence of Pugwash was very large indeed. I mean they had tremendous effects on the negotiation of a, of a test ban treaty, partial test ban yeah. treaty, for mm -hmm. example. Even uh, the war in Vietnam, they had influence on really? the future of that. You mm. know, I mean, the French Pugwash fellow called Markovic had close contacts with the Vietnamese oh, scientists. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and because of their mm. influence on their governments, and because of Pugwash's influence on the American government, they were able to at least investigate the possibility mm. of uh, negotiations. Mm -hmm. So that was a very valuable asset for Pugwash, yeah. which of course eventually disappeared, unfortunately, mm. as it contacts between East and West multiplied. Mm. But it was a very valuable organization in its day, yeah. mm. and extremely good to work for, of course, from the point of view of, as a young scientist, having yeah. uh, <coughs> contacts with these very famous people. It was mm. quite an experience for me. Mm. Was there anybody there particularly who influenced the way you, you thought about the problems and 
I mean, once the the famous generation of the Manhattan Project era had died out, were there people there who you found particularly interesting or particularly fascinating looking back? Well, you know, Rock Blad himself, of course, mm. was very inspirational and mm. uh, he inspired me, so I would name Rock Blad at the mm. top of that list. Yeah. Mm. But there were others, mm. and uh, of course, it stretched over a wide range of issues after the emphasis on nuclear diminished mm. somewhat, then chemical and biological warfare mm. became important and so on. Mm. Yes, it's interesting how things sort of come around, isn't it? Sort of now we're talking about weapons of mass destruction, which yeah. apparently includes biological and chemical yeah. Yeah, uh, all. aspects as well. Of course, the, the other interesting thing is that we, we're still in danger from nuclear weapons. Oh, yeah. And therefore, in a sense, the people who were, have been in this business for a number of decades have really wasted their time because, oh. in, in a way, I mean, they, there's, there has ha very few nuclear weapons have actually, well, been destroyed. Mm. And, mm. And, and this was the whole object of the exercise, yeah. to uh, oh. abolish nuclear weapons. And they're now very much alive and not abolished. Mm. Well, I suppose one way of, of being optimistic about this is to sort of say, well, you know, things are bad, but if we hadn't been there, there would have been a hell of a lot worse sort of thing. You know, it's a... Well, I find it very hard to be op optimistic. Really? Uh, I think the future is not easy to be optimistic about in terms of conflict mm. and uh, on willingness to learn lessons and yeah. so on. Mm. I don't think politicians are any better as time goes on. No, it, it, it is difficult to retain one's optimism. <laughs> it I is. sometimes <laughs> think one, one, all one has left is one's optimism. <laughs> so. But it's difficult, it really is difficult. It is extremely mm. difficult. Yeah. So, um, uh, Pugwash uh, and its importance, were there any sort of spin-offs from Pugwash as the contact broadened that you were involved with at this time, or did it just, did your, your, your sort of career sort of move from Pugwash to Cypri? Yes, or? it did, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. clearly. But of course, the range of issues that Cypri was dealing with in those days was mm. very similar to mm to things that Pugwash was interested yeah. in, so it wasn't a, wasn't a step change, really. No. So how did you come about, how did it come about that you became, now this is right, isn't it, you were the second director at, at, at yes. Cipri? Uh, after, after Frank? After, after Robert Neal. Uh, uh, yes, after Robert Neal. Yeah. And then, um, then I was the second. Um, how did you... Uh, I mean, I, I put this question to to Robert yesterday, which was my, my picture of Cipri in these days is that it was a Swedish organisation run by the British. <laughs> How did that come about? How did they involve you as the second director? Well, they offered me the job, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. Uh, I didn't apply for it. It was you were a phone call from, uh -huh. from Robert, yeah. essentially. Mm -hmm. mm. Are you, whom you'd met before and you knew him well? well? Yes, I did. I mean... Um, Almost certainly through Pugwash, mm, you see. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah. It was a Pugwash connection which was important, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I did a fair bit of writing and so on in yeah, those days. I remember. Um, and uh, how did you find Cipri when you got there? Was it, I mean, you said it was doing the same kinds of things in those days, but uh, our, my impression anyway is that Robert had very, and perhaps the Murdals had very carefully selected a number of things to do. Um, did you, when you came, decide to make changes or continue what was going on or what was, well, your, what was your vision for Cipri? Well, Robert did an excellent job and therefore there was not much need for any dramatic change. Mm. And also the organisation was going extremely well and, uh, and so change really wasn't mm. needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they, there was a massive study of chemical and biological mm. weapons uh, organized by Julian Perry Robinson, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, so that, that was ongoing. And of mm. course, the, they, they had by that time st established the Cipri yearbook, yes, yes. which had to be kept going. And, and um, we, we decided to bring it out annually. I mean, mm. It was quite a massive volume. Oh, so so yeah. that, that required quite a bit of effort mm. and manpower. Mm -hmm. But of course, 
One has to say that it was very generously financed, the institution, by the Swedish government. Mm. I mean, the, the money came from the Swedish parliament, so there was no fight for funds, really. Oh uh, boy, were you lucky. <laughs> and that was very lucky, mm -hmm. and it was a sign yeah. of the times, of yeah. course. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, the Swedish government also, apart from supplying you reasonably generously with funds, uh, did they leave you alone and oh, let yes. you get on with what uh, you... Oh, absolutely. I must, mm. I must emphasize mm. that. There was virtually no attempt to influence what we mm -hmm. were saying and doing. And of course that was rather a brave thing for the Swedish government. It was, of course, Olaf Palme was the yeah. Prime Minister. Mm. Because, uh, of course, we were analyzing the nuclear arms race saying things that were was upsetting both the Americans and the Russians and mm. the Soviets. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, the, 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 the possibility for embarrassment on the Swedish government mm. was quite large. Mm -hmm. was mm. the, they, they, they took a risk. Mm. But they, and, and I was never aware of any interference mm. from the government, which I think is a massive compliment to the Swedish government at that time. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. I have a colleague at the moment in my university who wrote a piece about Ethiopia the other day uh, and I bumped into him in the corridor and I said, you know, what reaction? And he said, everybody hates it. I must, I must have got it right. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, I, I know the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, um, uh, so, um, who at Cypri, apart from Julian, uh, who was working there at this time? I mean, was Mary still there? I guess she yes, must Yes, Mary been. were. Uh, Mary Caldor? Uh, both Mary and Julian left soon after I went. Mm -hmm. They yeah. moved back to England. Mm. Uh, Goldblatt was there, Joseph Goldblatt, who mm -hmm. was a Polish diplomat. Ah, okay. Uh, and uh, left Poland. He, 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 yes, he was. Uh, mm. He, he left Poland mm. uh, and uh, had a huge experience on negotiating nuclear disarmament mm. issues. So he's a very valuable person. And he went on with Cypri while I was during my time and longer. Mm. Uh, so he was very good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had, um, of course, there were many nationalities there. We had someone from Australia, for example. Mm someone from China mm. even, really, and a, a survivor of the Cultural Revolution, a, an army general who was a very, mm -hmm. very interesting guy, mm. and a Russian, mm. a Soviet. Was this a deliberate policy to sort of bring in people from all oh, yes. sides? Yeah, it's an mm. inter, it was an international peace research mm -hmm. institute, yeah. so that was a policy mm. To, mm. to do that, and it succeeded. Mm. And many of these people, we had a Yugoslav, for example, or two, mm. and they were very good, mm. and that gave the institute an international uh, flavor, mm. and they did some very good research. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, anything from those years which um, particularly you remember about contacts with other, I mean it was the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, so it was part of this whole peace research yeah, yes it was. movement. Yes. So uh, were there any particular contacts uh, or channels of communication to other institutes or other institutions that you found important and useful at that time? There were less of those contacts that one would have expected really. Mm -hmm. There were some, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with American uh, American groups. Mm. But you see, th this really paralleled what happened in Pugwash because as more and more of the original uh, natural scientists, particularly physicists, left, yeah. people came in. Mm. And some of those were in the peace research community, mm -hmm. some in, in, yeah. in Kenneth Boulding, for example, mm. yeah. and so on, came in to the Pugwash movement, and since mm. there were really close contacts between Cypri and Pugwash, ah. then we got to know them through mm -hmm. that route. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, it's more or less the same time, perhaps a little earlier, that you begin to get organizations like the International Peace Research Association set, setting itself That's right. up. Yes. Uh, and yes. Uh, I think probably a little earlier, I think you were part of the Conflict Research Society in London, as, as we right. both were. Yeah. 
So there's the beginning of this sort of yeah, that, movement right. to yes. interest the whole range of people in, in peace research. Yes. It began to broaden out very much from a, a concern about arms control, disarmament, about nuclear weapons into yeah. a whole series of other sort of channels. Um, and um, uh, did this have any effect on the kinds of things that you started to do at CIPRI or were you well, very much focused on, on the agenda that I guess Robert had started? It broadened out, mm. but very much the, the, that agenda was successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there was an element of luck in that because very much attention was given at CIPRI to the mm. Nuclear Weapons Institute, obviously, the right. Nuclear yeah. Weapons Institute, uh, it, excuse me, issue. Mm. And that, of course, was uh, very much of interest to everybody mm. because they were afraid that there would be a nuclear oh, world yes. war. That was very much a psychological mm. fear that yeah. people had, very, very mm. definite. No, it's something that my generation of students finds difficult to yeah, understand, of course. But they, I, you know, I remember this being in that atmosphere myself. So, right. yeah. yeah. Mm. So, because of that, what Cipri said got a lot of publicity. Mm. Uh, you know, the press were right. interested in it, and th there was a tendency, therefore, to stick at that mm. for obvious reasons. And of course, that then passed. And mm. so these days, simply you don't see mentioned very much mm. in, in the uh, well, by the media. Well, it may come back. It may, it may come back. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. But then, of course, they did. Simply did uh, get very much involved in the arms trade, mm. yeah. and it uh, produced yearly the arms trade register, mm. and also military expenditure. I mean, Frank Wackerby, for example, was yeah. there, mm -hmm. who worked very much on publishing world military expenditure tables mm. annually. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was of great value and of interest. Mm. So these issues, military expenditure, the arms trade, nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament, mm. chemical and biological warfare, all of which could be studied scientifically, mm. uh, were part of the SIPRI business. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and this was lucky that we, the, the work was pretty hard scientific mm, analysis yeah. mm. uh, and therefore credible. But subjects that the press and so on were interested in, so it got good publicity. Mm, and mm -hmm. uh, since the Institute saw, saw its task to some extent as public education, that was very helpful mm. and uh, good. Mm. Uh, and uh, coming back to you, though, for the for the moment, then you stayed at Cipri for how ten, many? Ten, ten years. It's okay. a legal maximum. Ah, okay. So they they did send a yeah, it's a five year contract. Uh -huh. so you could have two. Ah, okay. And at the time, it was, it was Frank Blackaby uh, there because no, Frank Blackaby was there with Robert. All oh, right. And, so he was in the they early days. Did day. the first yeah. two yearbooks. Uh -huh. And then Frank left and mm. come back to the Institute in London, mm. which uh, I think he became deputy director of that institute, of uh, the Economic Research yes. Institute. Yes, okay. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so uh, I've had a look at some of the things that he wrote in the Cipri book, about the, his, you know, the, the book about how Cipri started yes. as, as, as background for this. Okay, and um, so ten years is coming to an end. Cipri's well established and well regarded, and you are uh, coming back to England. What were your plans at that point? Well, I was offered a uh, visiting professorship at the Free University in Amsterdam, which uh -huh. I accepted, and I did that for four years. Oh, so you didn't come back immediately then? Well, I, I, I came back and established, uh, because I had two children, and mm. the family wanted to establish itself, obviously, in, yeah. mm -hmm. in Britain. So wife. you commuted? You must have been yeah, one I, of the, the early Euro commuters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was very easy from Southampton, you see. Oh, OK, yes, yeah, the airport just, there. Did, yeah, uh, just did, one hour. Uh -huh, uh -huh. In fact, I could be in my office and 
Amsterdam sooner than I could be in an office in Manchester, for example. <laughs> well, well, we won't go into British rail travel yeah. at the moment, <laughs> for the moment anyway. Um, so what uh, particular line of, uh, of th research and thinking did you do at the Free University? Were you still well, very much in, in nuclear issues? Well, I mean, generally speaking, I gave a course on mm. um, armaments and disarmament in general, mm. including the, arm, the conventional armaments, yeah. nuclear mm -hmm. armaments, uh, with, mm. uh, chemical and what we now call weapons of mass destruction, mm. and of course disarmament. Mm. But I also became very interested in, in uh, <coughs> non-provocative defence, in other words. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, yeah. And I worked in Amsterdam with a colleague called Egbert Booker, mm -hmm. and the two of us <coughs> developed this non-provocative mm -hmm. defence, or non-offensive defence mm -hmm. uh, thing, very, uh, the, the very early days of the topic, and did, mm -hmm. but it eventually became rather popular. Yeah. And the uh, institute, for example, was set up in Copenhagen, Mm. specifically to discuss NOD, mm. non-offensive defence. Mm -hmm. And of course, eventually, uh, Gorbachev took it up. Uh, That's right, he did, didn't yeah, he? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was very good, mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting, and I enjoyed working with Booker mm. on that. Mm -hmm. We wrote quite a lot about it, including a book. So that was quite nice. Mm. Mm. And then... Uh, after the four years were up, but no, let's think a little bit more about that four years because this was early 80s? Uh, yes, it was, 81 mm -hmm. to 85. 85. Uh -huh. yeah. So that was after the, after, well after Vietnam. Uh, I was going to ask you if we can go back a little bit um, to, to Cypri, of course. One of the things that very much affected the field of peace research in the, seven, the early 70s, of course, was the Vietnam War. And you know, there were several conferences where there were enormous divisions between people over what attitudes to take. Did Cypri get affected by that at all, by this sort of debate about Vietnam and was, had peace research? I mean, the debate was basically about had peace research been co-opted by, you know, yes. by the United States government? Yes, right. And uh, did that? Did the ripples of that affect Cypri at all? I remember the debate, and mm. of course some Cypri researchers were interested mm. in it, but it didn't affect Cypri as an institution really. Mm. We didn't get involved mm. in that because we, there were so many other obvious things to do. Yeah. It didn't mm. seem uh, more important than those issues, mm. such mm. as such as the arms trade, yeah. nuclear mm. disarmament, and so mm. on. Yeah. Uh, so, again, going back to your time at the Free University, you were sort of pioneering this idea of non-offensive defence. Um, and you'd you know, gone back to what you could, for the want of a better word, call a normal academic career. Um, yes. What, um, was, uh, what was your next step after that? And how did, you, how did that fit into what you'd done previously? Well, I still, I mean, for my whole working life, I've been working on nuclear disarmament, mm. nuclear weapon issues, yeah. mm -hmm. but also civil nuclear issues as well, because mm. they're clearly connected. Sure. I mean, mm. there's, you, you can't distinguish between civil and military nuclear things. Well, they're trying to do it with Iran, but I think you're probably <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, that simply continues mm. and still mm. does. Yeah. So. Uh, there we are. I mean, there's no lack of activity. Mm. Um, there's no lack of need. No, exactly, mm. yes. Mm. So I came back here after Amsterdam and set up a sort of freelance activity, mm -hmm. consultancy and so on. Mm. Um, yes, I, I, could, I, connect some, I could, um, kept some connection with the Netherlands, because mm -hmm. I did some teaching at the Technical University in Delft and so on. Mm. So it was a mixture of things, and I got a grant from Roundtrees and so on. Mm -hmm. And you've done quite a bit of work with the Oxford Group, have you not? With yes, so I started there about 14 years ago mm. with the Oxford Research Group, mm -hmm. uh, which, were, which is, a, was, was a, is a good group to work with. Mm -hmm. um, but, Still on nuclear issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I haven't left the nuclear field really. Mm. 
Mm. <coughs> Did you ever sort of consider uh, a move to Bradford? Because that was very much part of their remit, I think. And it's interesting the way uh, that department has developed. Uh, I think it's mainly Paul Rogers, of course, who's sort of uh, involved in that. But have you had much contact with them? Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, right from the very beginning, yeah. I mm. had with Adam, yes, Adam Cohen of course. and so on. Mm. So I, I, I've seen that mm. group at Bradford develop, which it has done remarkably well. Oh, yeah, yes. And now many mm. foreign students there now. Uh, we were up there, I think it's about a year ago now, uh, and we already interviewed Adam and um, we went up and we inter interviewed James O'Connell and Paul. Oh, James, yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and my old friend Malcolm Dando. Oh, I'm Malcolm, sure he well, absolutely. He, he's yeah. still there. And, still uh, there. Still going on. Okay. Um, absolutely. So what are you working on now, if that's not a leading question? Well, I'm working on this so-called nuclear renaissance, the mm. enthusiasm of governments for civil nuclear power. Right. Because they say they need security of energy supplies mm. and they're mm. worried about global warming, the right. emission of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel mm -hmm. uh, burning. Mm. And therefore there's this renaissance of nuclear power, mm. civil nuclear power. But because there's really no difference between the civil and the military, mm. then the consequences of that for nuclear weapon proliferation are extremely serious. Yeah. And, right. and also, I would think, say particularly for nuclear terrorism. Mm. So, I mean, that's, a, I think, a major issue now, how to deal with this nuclear renaissance, what effects it will have on nuclear weapon proliferation, uh, what, uh, how so significantly increased are the threats of nuclear terrorism mm. and so on. So this is my major okay. uh, concern. What would a world with many nuclear powers, nuclear weapon powers, look like? Mm. And, and that's what one can foresee yeah. in mm. the future. I mean, Iran, you mentioned, is a good example. I mean, mm. We have North Korea, so we, we <coughs> in addition to the five established nuclear weapon mm. powers that have been there since the Non-Proliferation Treaty, we already have India, Pakistan, and North Korea, yeah. and Israel. And yeah, so so I say Israel. Nine of them, mm. yeah. and one can see Iran being the tenth, mm. and so on. And then there's Japan there. Uh, certainly, uh, with the possibility. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So we can see a world with a large number of nuclear weapon powers, either latent or actual, mm. powers that could develop nuclear weapons very rapidly because they have the fissile material mm. and the technical know-how from their civil programs. What would that world be like? Yeah. So that's my major interest. Uh -huh. at the moment. Okay. Are you working with colleagues on that, or? Uh, yes, we're trying to. Uh, to get some sort of, I mean, when I say we, the Oxford Research Group are trying mm. to collaborate with the, uh, a, a small group at the University of Wales, Aberystwyth. Oh, at Abbo, uh, yeah, yes. Abbo, uh, is still Ken, it, Ken Booth. Oh, Ken's example. still there, of oh, course. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so we have that contact, mm -hmm. which is yes, interesting. Um, but it's interesting the way that particular department has grown from you know, you know, something strange out in Wales to exactly. being a real power in yes. the uh, yes. in, in this country anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know to give him credit. I think Steve Smith had, had a lot to do with yes. that as well. Yes. But yeah, Ken has yeah. been there for yeah. quite a while. Yes, uh, he has. So there's a kind of a network going up now with the Oxford Research Group and Abba, Abba and you uh, working on this this sort of. Um, the whole problem of the nuclear genie poking its head out of the bottle again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, aside from that, um, looking into the future if we can, what would you like to see time, effort, research and resources devoted to in the future? If you could, you know, if the Swedish government could start up again and, and say what would you like to do and we will think of you know, supporting it. What would what would you say? What well, would it would have to be the nuclear issue. Yeah. I think this is the crucial thing we mm. face. Mm. Um, and I, I would think specifically nuclear terrorism. Mm -hmm. If there is going to be 
a nuclear incident in the foreseeable future, mm. I think it will be a terrorist mm -hmm. one. So the general uh, problem of terrorism, I think, is a major issue. And of course, global warming is a uh, one of the top concerns right. in mm. international affairs. Mm. Uh, so there's a linkage between this. I mean, the reason given by countries to go into much more nuclear energy is, of course, the global warming mm. problem. And that is a very major issue. Mm. So I think that set of global pro problems, uh, expansion of nuclear power, mm. global warming and so on, would be what I would like to see studied. Okay. Well, that's looking forward, looking back a bit. Um, we were talking about optimism a while ago, and you sounded sounded as though you were a little disappointed with what's been achieved and uh, what's still to be done. I mean, why, sorry, is that a reasonable reading of, of what you were implying? Yes, I think it underestimates what I feel. I mean, I feel almost totally pessimistic. I, uh. Uh, <coughs> I mean, it is a, <coughs> a interesting situation. I mean, when mm. you consider what scientists do. We have maybe, I don't know, a few million certain scientists in research <coughs> globally, yeah. and 25% of them, at least, are working in military research mm. and development. And they're the best 25% because they get the most money. Mm -hmm. The governments fund them most generously. And you see, it, that uh, resource could be diverted and could solve virtually the global problems we've mentioned. Mm. Uh, but, and this seems to me to be a certain craziness about it, but uh, unless the political leaders decide this is crazy and we have to stop it, it won't mm. stop. Mm. And so, and, and that I think could be the major reason why uh, we move into very serious military issues, mm. military problems. Mm. The power of the military industrial complex, which we were warned about by Eisenhower in '53, yeah. is still Long very time, much there yeah. and getting stronger all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has also puzzled me somewhat because, you know, like you, I've been, you know, 40 years of my life, I've been sort of you know, putting into trying to do something about these problems. I mean, you've been interested in sort of nuclear. Uh, issues. I've been interested in sort of problems of, of you know, ethnic conflict. We don't seem to have had much effect. Why do you think that is? Much I mean, effect? Yes. I mean, I'm almost well, as pessimistic uh, as you. Uh, I think we... <coughs> what we have failed to do is to find a way of influencing policy, mm. government policy, and that's really the key to it. Mm. And I think that the, the way politics works, particularly in Western democracy, with very short-term governments, you know, in the case of Britain, mm. five years maximum, four years on average, the government changes, mm -hmm. civil servants change and all the rest of it. There's no body of people who give a long-term, serious study of these things and and how policy can be affected. And mm. this is a, 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 you know, if you take the nuclear issue, how does one persuade the government not to go into new nuclear power reactors? Mm. This, this mm. is a major issue. Well, the, the arguments that one can bring to bear are, I think, uh, it's a very, very strong indeed, very convincing. Mm. And yet, it's very hard to get into the mind of the prime minister or the you know the major policy yeah. makers, mm. th these arguments, mm. uh, uh, and so until we find a way of doing that, and until we get political leaders who are strong enough mm. to say this is silly, we must stop it and change the policy. Mm. I don't think we'll get anywhere, mm. and we haven't yet had such political leaders. And I think one of the problems is the short termness of the governments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, your advice would be um, to 
um, make the arguments more persuasive to the governments or make the arguments more persuasive to the, cons the constituents so that they pressure the government? I mean, well, I did one, one time think that uh, educating public opinion was the way mm. to, as you say, put pressure on political leaders in the democratic system and you know when they're faced with elections and so on, but that mm. doesn't work. Mm. I mean, the, as we can see with the, in Britain with the war on Iraq, I mean, the political leadership went ahead in spite of the fact yeah. mm. that there were so many people against it. Mm. But you see, I mean, that, that really indicates part of the problem because mm. you can build up a strong objection to a policy, but it's exceedingly hard to get more than half the population interested in it. Until you've got a huge constituency, mm. the politicians are not really very impressed. Mm. And it's that getting that number of people yeah. to, to express opposition is very difficult. Mm. I mean, you know, when people are interested in, uh, are worried about mortgages, standards of living, you mm. know, and, and so on and so forth, they're not going to be pressing the politicians on these mm. issues that we're interested in, mm. which doesn't have a great deal of pub pub public appeal. Mm. <coughs> and presumably, you know, there's something way down the road that we, you know, we're really rather bad at sort of thinking into the future, aren't we, about what will happen. So maybe, <coughs> I don't know, I mean, I, I was puzzled by this, as I'm sure you were, because Lois and I were in London the weekend of that enormous demonstration against the war. It was the biggest demonstration I think I've seen since the 1960s. Sure. And it had, as far as one can tell, no effect at all. Yeah. That's mm. right. Mm. And of course, I mean, I mean, we can remember the <coughs> similar demonstration against cruise missiles. Yeah. <coughs> and, yeah. Uh, you, you know, the Pershing and all that. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> but that had no effect. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very, very hard to get sufficient people, mm. you know, something approaching half the population to press together on mm. an important international inter issue, yeah. issue which, frankly speaking, not many people are that interested in compared with their everyday concerns. Yeah. Yeah. But until we achieve that, then I don't think we're going to change things very dramatically. A um, little bit more about the nth country sort of problem. Um, which I guess in non-jargon terms is, what sort of a world is it going to be when more and more countries have their own nuclear weapons? Um, do you think this is going to be a very dangerous situation? And after all, why not? You know, why should countries not you know, have nuclear weapons? Why should only some countries have nuclear weapons? What, what, what do you, what's your response to that? Well, that's a very interesting and very difficult question mm. because, you know, you can very well argue that uh, the nuclear weapon, if, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, then this will in some extent balance the Israeli nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and that could be a stabilizing influence mm. in that region. You can yes. argue that. Well, everybody used to argue about the nuclear balance, didn't yes, they? Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm. And, and so that, that is a possible argument. On the other hand, of course, there's no question that if a country gets nuclear weapons, it, uh, really there's a domino effect. Mm. I mean, North Korea, for example, if uh, North Korea c continues increasing its nuclear weapon arsenal, mm. then this is going to put great pressure on Japan and then South Korea mm. and maybe uh, uh, other countries in the region to get them too. Mm. And if Iran gets them, it's going to raise the issue in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Yeah. So there is that domino effect, there's mm -hmm. no question about it. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, countries like North Korea and Iran feel under great threat from, in the case of Iran, Israel and the United States. Mm -hmm. And they see nuclear weapons as uh, a way of addressing that threat. Mm -hmm. And Iran is clearly impressed by the fact that when North Korea clearly uh, showed that it had nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and tests them, but no, no one doubts that it has, maybe not very many, but some, mm. then the attention of America shifted, in, the, in that case, to Iran. Mm. So those factors do uh, apply. And, of mm. course, countries are 
don't ignore the fact that the five permanent members of the Security Council are all nuclear weapon powers, and therefore sure. there is this power mm. factor. Yeah. And this is, of course, in my opinion, why France and Britain won't get rid of their nuclear weapons, because it enables them to maintain that remnant, mm. of, remnant of great power status that they, they now have. So they don't want to lose that last uh, part of it. Mm. But I think that, the, on the other hand, a, a, a very large driver here is civil nuclear power. Mm. Because as countries, more and more countries get more and more nuclear reactors, they, they accumulate fissile material, particularly plutonium, which mm. can be used in nuclear weapons. Mm. And so we're moving into a world which we call the plutonium economy, where these materials become more and more available to governments, but also to subnational uh, actors mm, like yeah, terrorists. Yeah. And, and I think it's almost inevitable that this will happen, that there will be, well, it is inevitable, yeah. uh, that more and more countries will become latent nuclear weapon powers in the sense that in a very short time they can develop nuclear weapons using their, the plutonium mm. they have and the expertise they have from their civil nuclear mm. program. Mm. So that is an inevitability. Now, mm. how we're going to handle that situation, I, 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 I don't know. And I haven't yet read any sensible suggestions that it will, it will mm. happen mm. because one has to remember that sovereignty is still a very powerful factor yes. in international relations. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, countries are not going to give that up. Mm. And so therefore, they regard it as their sovereign, inalienable right to develop civil nuclear power yeah. mm -hmm. and then possibly nuclear weapons. So it is a very dangerous yeah. world we're moving into mm. and uh, I, I really personally can't see a solution to it. Mm. Uh, uh. Well, that's one reason, I guess, for you know, being fairly pessimistic about it. But I mean, there is another side to this. We were talking earlier on about um, you know, the disappointments and the uh, our failures to influence policy makers and that sort of thing, but there must be a brighter side to, to that. You know, there must be some achievements that one can look back on and think, oh, well, that was a that was something that we did that uh, made it a better world, even in a small way. You must do that occasionally, Frank. What, what do you think? Well, well, there are things one can bring up. For example. <coughs> The uh, anti-Vietnam War movement in the U.S., for mm. example, I think probably had an effect on Nixon and mm. what mm -hmm. followed and uh, was, was a factor in bringing the Vietnam War to an end. Mm. Uh, how quickly, I mean, what difference it made is very hard to, to imagine, but I think it was certainly a positive success. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you can mention things like that, and of mm. course the... Uh, <clears throat> the uh, um, popular movement to which caused a partial test ban treaty, mm -hmm. the, yeah. sort of the mothers who were afraid of their children. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah I was going to say, you know, yeah, in, in your own field there must be some things like that which yes. sort of encourage you. Well, there are very few of them, mm. uh, but uh, uh, I think what one is, if, uh, if, uh, <coughs> what occurs to one more is the difficulty of persuading politicians to move in a positive direction. Mm. That's what we have to do, if we're going to succeed, what we have to do, and we haven't yet found a way of doing it. Mm. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the South Africans have gave up their nuclear weapons, but then was that because they didn't want a black government to have them? Mm. Or was it a genuine f uh, wish to give up mm. nuclear weapons. Yeah. And of course there are other countries, Kazakhstan for example, the ex-Soviet republics were left with nuclear weapons mm. and they, all of them, sent them back to, mm -hmm. to Russia. Yeah. Well you can argue that's a very positive thing. Mm. So there are things that uh, could be used as a um, sign of hope. Mm. But as I say, the, uh, the, the forces which are propelling us into these dangerous waters are very, very hard to control. Mm. And I, I personally would argue that sovereignty is one of the major 
issues here. Mm. Countries will not give up one iota of their sovereignty willingly. Mm. And that makes life very, very difficult. So, yeah. And also, I mean, I, I think we, we would need very much to strengthen the United Nations. And mm. that, uh, that's also proving difficult to do and, uh, for many reasons. Mm. You know, partly the attitude of the U.S. to the United Nations, mm. the right wing of mm. in de democratic countries are basically suspicious of the U.N. Mm. So all of these things add up to feelings of uh, less than optimism. Mm. <coughs> well, yes, uh, I think you've... You have grounds for your less than <laughs> optimism, I think. Okay. All right, there's one question I should have asked at the very beginning, but it got, sort of got lost and swept under the carpet. So, uh, the, uh, there was a sort of an emerging field or something that existed you know, back when you and I were both sort of starting in the sort of early 60s. And some people called it peace studies, and some people called it peace research, and some people called it conflict analysis, and one thing or other. Um, were you conscious of entering that field when you started to um, become interested in Pugwash and then join Pugwash? I mean, what did you think you were getting involved with when you were at that early stage? Did any of this sort of um, this labelling? Uh, make you feel, ah, oh, I'm going to become a member of that, that trade, oh. that movement, that discipline, that whatever it was? Well, if there was a phrase or a word for it, I, I think in my case it would have been disarmament. Mm -hmm. I think that the, it was the seeing the inexorable build-up of arm armaments mm -hmm. of arsenals, yeah. nuclear and conventional, uh -huh. still going on. With with, yeah. with, a, with a vengeance, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the difficulty of doing anything about that—that mm -hmm. that I think was the driving force yeah. that led people into studying these mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think that's uh, <clears throat> that's certainly the case uh, with those days. I mean, uh, you know, um, talking earlier as we were in the car about my being down here and being in the air force. Yes. I mean, the dominant thing at that stage, uh, as far as I was concerned, was trying to defend the country against nuclear attack, and everybody believed that it was sure. very possible. Sure. Very sure. possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that is important to get across, that mm. the fear of nuclear war in those days mm. was uh, uh, very strong indeed. I mean, mm. it did affect one's life. Mm. As the, the the mushroom cloud, yeah. as people know, yeah. and I think that young people, my children, for example, simply cannot understand that. Mm. They, they they don't fear nuclear war, mm. and uh, they can't really understand a world in which this was a major fear that yeah. one lived under this mm. fear. Yeah. Mm. Let me push you a bit more on this business about you know, peace uh, and the peace research and peace movements and things like that, because. We mentioned earlier that sort of peace was a problem. You now the word the peace. Word, yes. You know, yep. Did you find that at all in your own work? I mean, was that a part of the reason for you saying disarmament was what you were getting into? Well, I, I agree with you. Mm. I mean, peace. The word peace was a problem. It was linked, and still is, with the the extreme left wing, mm. with uh, uh, environmentalism and all that, mm. which is. Uh, politically unacceptable in many countries, mm. including Britain. I mean, I think uh, Tony Blair, for example, is very conscious of not to be seen, to be mm. affected by this sort of left-wing mm. peace movement. Mm. Uh, that's not uh, what a strong leader should uh, mm. should be. So it, it still has an effect, mm. and uh, 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 certainly. But I don't. I don't think I consciously no. uh, was put off by the word peace. Mm. I mean, I hope not. Mm -hmm. But uh, nuclear disarmament was what I yeah. was in, what okay. I was doing, and and of course nuclear armaments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was armaments and disarmament mm. were, was, were the, were the two thing. words that uh, uh, describe my activities. I think mm -hmm. best. And you were happy with that, so. 
Yes. Mm. I, I mean, I, I think war is a terrible thing, and one would certainly want to live in a peaceful time. Mm. And I suppose, in a sense, you can argue that uh, when the Cold War ended, the world, in a way, in, 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 in the world was more peaceful, mm. although uh, the, the, uh, the arms races went on. I mean, that's another term, the arms race, mm. which I think the, the driving force of the arms race explains uh, um, quite a few of the prob problems mm. we face and have faced. Yeah. But the, I think the, the since the Cold War, the problems have moved from global to regional. Mm -hmm. And if there is now going to be a nuclear war, and I think there is still a, a danger of that, mm. then it will be regional rather than global. How far it will spread is another matter. But whereas we were, in those days, uh, frightened that the northern hemisphere may be destroyed, mm. I think the, the more reasonable fear these days is that a region that will be destroyed, the Middle East or whatever. Yeah. Mm. Mm. All right, my last question is, if you'd been sitting here interviewing Frank Barnaby, uh, what's a question that you would have asked that you haven't been asked? What have we missed out? What would I you like I, to have been asked? I would ask myself, why did you waste your life on these issues oh. when you've achieved very little? And, yes. uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough verdict, but I, mm. I, I feel it is, is relevant. I mean, we, when I think back to the early 60s, then what, the list of things that one had ambitions to achieve in those days haven't been achieved. In fact, the situation, I think, has grown steadily worse. And it's this lack of the, uh, the finding a way to affect political leaders to move in right directions, mm. from our point of view, right direction, is really very depressing. And I don't see how we're going to do that. How are we going to affect the men and women that control these things, mm. and have, who are able to say stop or, or whatever, or to control it, how are we going to get to them? And mm. I, 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 it's really, I think, an insoluble problem. And I, I have to say that I think democracy is a problem here, that when mm. governments change very frequently, civil servants don't stay in their jobs very long, Everyone, everything changes every few years. Mm. I, it's, it's, it's not a, an easy way of dealing with these global problems. And uh, on the other hand, you can't think of a better system than yeah. democracy. Mm. So I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me that you could conclude that human beings are developing in, in the intelligence, sort of intelligence, which produces these problems, particularly uh, scientifically and technologically, mm. but we don't have the intelligence to control the, the consequences of them. Mm. And so I think there's very well we may end up destroying ourselves because of the nature of our intelligence. We're very, very good at destructive processes, particularly through science and technology. Mm. We're very bad at getting systems for control of the consequences of those activities. Mm.